two. This would be the third video I've made for this chapter, but it is second part of the chapter. It's about respiratory physiology. We've looked at the anatomy, the structural components of the lungs and the rest of the respiratory system. Now we're going to look at the physiology, how they get that oxygen and get it delivered to where it needs to go. So we'll start with the mechanical aspects of breathing. This is going to be a little more physics. Um, one of the reasons we quickly reviewed physics about 14 chapters ago, but in any event. Pulmonary ventilation uh, consists of two phases, an inspiration where gases flow into the lungs, air, and an expiration when the gases leave the lungs. And they do so because of pressure relationships within the thoracic cavity. One of the first pressures we need to deal with is atmospheric pressure. That is the pressure that's exerted by the air around us on the body. And that's typically around 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. That's what we call one atmosphere. Uh, if you go away from sea level, it will change. But uh, as long as you stay within uh, our range of tolerance, don't go to extremes, uh, you, we can work with one atmosphere. Respiratory pressures will be described relative to the atmospheric pressure. Uh, a negative respiratory pressure would mean the pressure inside is less than the pressure outside the atmospheric pressure. A positive respiratory pressure would be that the pressure inside is greater than the atmospheric pressure. And a zero respiratory pressure would mean that the uh, pressure would be equal to the atmospheric pressure or approximately 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level, one atmosphere. So intrapulmonary pressure is the pressure within the alveoli. It is also called the intraalveolar pressure. This pressure is going to func uh, excuse me, fluctuate with breathing. It will eventually equalize to the atmospheric pressure. The intrapleural pressure is the pressure in the pleural cavity that also fluctuates with breathing, but it's always a negative pressure. There's always less pressure than the atmospheric pressure. Uh, and it's usually about four millimeters of mercury less than uh, the atmospheric pressure. The fluid level <clears throat> has to be kept at a minimum for that. So excessive fluid is pumped out by the lymphatic system. Uh, if fluid does accumulate, a positive intrapleural pressure can develop and that would cause the lung to collapse. The uh, total inward forces are actually promoting, leaning towards lung collapse, and that is the lung's natural, attendance, natural tendency to recoil. Because it's so elastic, they always try to assume the smallest size. Uh, and because of the surface tension of the alveolar fluid, that surface tension pulls on the alveoli, trying to reduce the alveolar size. There is one outward force that tends to enlarge the lungs, and that is the elasticity of the chest wall that pulls the thorax outward. So a negative uh, interpleural pressure would be affected by those three opposing forces, uh, and that helps to maintain a strong adhesive force between the parietal and visceral pleura. The transpulmonary pressure is the pulmonary pressure minus the intrapleural pressure and that's the pressure that keeps the lung spaces open keeps the lungs from collapsing the greater that transpulmonary pressure the larger the lungs will be the lungs will collapse if the intrapulmonary pressure intrapleural pressure is equal to the pulmonary pressure or if the intrapleural pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure so we must keep a negative intrapleural pressure to keep the lungs inflated So this is our atmospheric pressure, it's what we have in the air. Transpulmonary pressure should be about four millimeters of mercury different, should be a negative four. Uh, intrapleural pressure should be a negative four. And that would lead to intrapulmonary pressure of zero millimeters of mercury equal to the um, atmospheric pressure. In a pneumothorax, when the lung collapses because air gets in here, 
the uh, pressure changes are messed up and leading to a collapsed lung. At atelectasis is that lung collapse that can be due to plugged bronchioles that cause the collapse of the alveoli or a pneumothorax, which is air that gets into the pleural cavity. That can occur from a wound in the parietal pleura or rupture of the visceral pleura. It's treated by removing that air with chest tubes. Uh, and when the pleural heal, the lungs will reinflate. Uh, pulmonary ventilation is inspiration and expiration, and those are mechanical processes that are going to depend on volume changes in the thoracic cavity. Volume is going to be related to pressure. So if you change volumes, you are changing pressures, and changes in those pressures will lead to the flow of gases either in or out in an attempt to equalize the pressure with atmospheric pressure. And we've just, we don't, but physics describes that using Boyle's law. Boyle's law is the relationship between the pressure and volume of a gas. Uh, gases always fill the container they are in. Uh, it's part of the properties of gas. The amount of gas is the same. The container side is, is reduced. You increase pressure. If the container size is increased, you decrease pressure. So the pressure is going to vary inversely with volume. Mathematically, uh, pressure 1 times volume 1 is going to be equal to pressure 2 times volume 2. So if you change the volume, you must change the pressure. Inspiration is an active process that involves the inspiratory muscles, and those are the diaphragm and the external intercostals. The diaphragm, when it's a dome shaped, when it contracts, it moves inferiorly and flattens out, so that increases the thoracic volume. The intercostal muscles, when they contract, the rib cage is lifted up and out, uh, like when you raise a handle on a bucket, uh, and that results in an increased thoracic volume. So both the contraction of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles are going to increase thoracic volume. As you increase thoracic volume, the lungs are stretched, they are pulled out with a thoracic cage, that drops the intrapulmonary pressure by about one millimeter of mercury. And because of the difference in atmospheric and intrapural pressures, air is going to flow into the lungs down its pressure gradient until the pulmonary and atmospheric pressure equal. During that same time, the intrapleural pressure is going to lower to about six millimeters less than the atmospheric pressure. Inspiration or forced inspiration can occur if you are vigorously exercising or if your patients happen to have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. In that case, you're going to use extra muscles, accessory muscles to help increase the size of the thoracic cavity. Uh, scalenes, sternocleidomastoid, and the pectoralis muscles, the erector spinae muscles of the back can also help straighten out the thoracic curvature and they are going to act to further increase the size of the cage and that creates a larger pressure gradient so more air is drawn in. So inspiration contracts, the muscle uh, diaphragm descends, the rib cage rises, thoracic cavity volume increases, lungs are stretched, interpulmonary volume increases, and when interpulmonary volume increases, the pressure drops and the air comes in to fill that gap. Uh, expiration normally is a passive process. If you are just sitting breathing, quiet expiration doesn't require you to contract muscles. What you do is relax the inspiratory muscles. When you relax the diaphragm and the external intercostals, the cavity goes back to its original size, that's going to decrease the volume of the lungs. That decreasing the volume of lungs increases the pressure, and that extra pressure m removes some of the air that uh, came in during inspiration. We can also have a forced expiration, though. That would be an active process, and to do that, to decrease the size of the thoracic cavity, you would use the oblique muscles and the transverse abdominal muscles and the internal intercostal muscles. So you relax the diaphragm 
and the external intercostals that causes the thoracic volume to decrease the decrease in thoracic volume uh, it then causes an increase in pressure and the pressure drives the air out and you can have a forced expiration on top of that so an interpulmonary pressure is when the pressure inside the lung decreases as lung volume increases that's during inspiration that pressure increases during expiration interpleural pressure is a pleural cavity pressure it becomes more negative as the chest wall expands during inspiration and returns to its initial volume as the chest wall recoils and that leads to the volume of a breath so during each breath the pressure gradients moves about a half a liter of air into and out of the lungs there are some non-respiratory movements that occur uh, in fact some of these have been have become very very naughty things to do in public with this whole covid thing uh, but there are processes that move air in or out of the lungs besides breathing uh, some can modify normal uh, respiratory rhythm uh, most of them are the results of reflexive action although some of them are voluntary so coughing and sneezing those are the ones we don't want to do in the covid age uh, but crying can do it laughing does it hiccups can do it and yawns can do it so physical factors that influence that pulmonary ventilation uh, there are three physical factors the airway resistance the alveolar surface tension and lung compliance airway resistance uh, comes from friction it is a major non-elastic source of resistance to gas flow it occurs in the airways uh, if we look again at the math and the physics and don't get too bogged down in these mathematical equations they may show up on some of the homework but uh, flow pressure and resistance flow is directly proportional to uh, pressure differences and inversely proportional to resistance so uh, two millimeters of less during normal quiet breathing which means that two millimeters of mercury difference is sufficient to move a half a liter 500 milliliters of air and gas flows uh, change inversely with resistance that resistance in the respiratory tree is usually insignificant the diameters of the airway in the first part of the conducting zones are huge the progressive branching of the airways as they get smaller leads to an increase in total surface area uh, cross-sectional area so that helps uh, any resistance that does occur usually occurs in the medium-sized bronchi uh, and that resistance will disappear at the terminal bronchi and diffusion is going to be moving gas uh, and we'll get to that in another section as airway resistance rises breathing movements become more strenuous uh, severe constriction or obstructed bronchioles can prevent ventilation uh, and they can occur during acute asthma attacks and actually stop ventilation epinephrine uh, is very good at dilating bronchioles it reduces air resistance and allows those patients to breathe surface tension surface tension is the attraction of liquid molecules to one another at a gas liquid interface it tends to draw liquid molecules closer together reduce contact with dissimilar gas molecules uh, it resists forces that tend to increase surface area of the liquid water has a very high surface tension it coats the alveolar walls in a thin film and that tends to cause the alveoli to shrink to their smallest size and they would collapse uh, in the uh, without the use of a surfactant and surfactant is a detergent like lipid protein that complexes and helps reduce the surface tension of alveolar fluid it prevents the alveolar from collapsing uh, completely shrinking uh, and it's produced by type 2 alveolar cells that we mentioned in the first part of this talk insufficient quantities of surfactant are not uncommon in premature infants and they can cause infant infant respiratory distress syndrome IRDS uh, the increased surface tension results in collapse of the alveoli with each breath so the alveoli must be completely reinflated during an inspiration and that takes a tremendous amount of energy uh, fetal lungs don't produce adequate amounts of surfactant until at least two months of development so it's a it's common for preemies the treatment is to spray natural or synthetic surfactants into the newborn's air passages that 
positive pressure devices can keep the alveola open between breaths, uh, but severe cases may require mechanical ventilation. And survivors of mechanical ventilation sometimes develop bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is a chronic childhood lung disease. Lung compliance is a measure of the change of lung volume with a given change in transpulmonary pressure. Basically what it is is how much stretch the lungs have. Normally there is a very high lung compliance because the lung tissue is disdainable. That surfactant decreases alveolar surface tension uh, and what that means is higher lung comp compliance means easier to expand the lungs. We can again write it out mathematically. Uh, compliance would be the change in volume over the change in pulmonary and intrapleural pressure. Uh, so compliance will go down if there is non-elastic scar tissue replacing lung tissue. And that would be an example of fibrosis. If we have reduced production of surfactant or if there's decreased flexibility in the thoracic cage. And any decrease in those res natural resiliency is going to diminish lung compliance. So chronic inflammation or infections such as tuberculosis can lead to that non-elastic scarring, uh, replacing normal tissue, that is fibrosis. Uh, decreased production of surfactant would also impair lung compliance. And the lower the lung compliance, the more energy it takes to breathe. Total compliance of the respiratory system is also influenced by the thoracic wall, and that could be changed with deformities of the thorax. Uh, ossification of costal cartilage, if that cartilage is normally flexible, becomes bone-like, which is common in old age, or paralysis of the intercostal muscles. All right, uh, I'm going to break there. In the next section, we'll talk about how we determine uh, how well lungs are